All right, welcome into the shop. It is great to have you all here. Now, I am very, very excited about this video series. Super pumped to be getting started on it. It's been in the works for a while. So Colby Lanham, who works at the Alamo, reached out to me in September and asked if I wanted to help contribute to a project they were working on in restoring some of the cannons from the Battle of the Alamo. And of course, I sent back an email with an enthusiastic yes. And so they've commissioned me to build a pattern for a four pound cannon and the carriage for it to sit on. Very exciting. They actually invited me down to the Alamo uh, end of last year. I took the whole family down there and they gave us a behind the scenes tour. Colby and Ernesto, the two guys who kind of manage and run and curate the Alamo. I've actually become good friends with Colby and we found out that we have a distant relative uh, who was a Texas Ranger uh, back in the days, which is pretty cool. All that being said, my job is to make a pattern of the cannon. It's a four pound can, not very big, about 42 inches long. We're gonna make a wood pattern in this video. Then we're gonna ship that pattern up uh, to a company who's gonna cast it. And my hope, no promises yet, but my hope is that um, I will be able to film that too, fly up there and film that process. And then the finished cannon's coming back to my shop and we're gonna build the carriage. So this is gonna be drawn out a little bit of ways, but I wanna go ahead and post the first video to get, to get things started. So let's just jump right in and let's build this pattern. Okay, so first I've got to kind of apologize. My voice is a little bit cracky. Uh, got a bit of a cold right now. So just bear with me on that. We're gonna start this process with um, the blank. So it's a, basically I made this blank out of poplar. It's, it was eight quarter poplar and I think there's eight pieces. So it's a fairly large chunk of wood to be putting on the lathe. Um, right now I've just taken it out of the clamps and it's dry and I'm cutting to size. So this is a great use of the Oliver bandsaw. This is an old uh, Oliver model 35, 36 inch bandsaw that was built in 1925 that I restored. And it is a heavy duty machine that handles these kind of tasks perfectly. So uh, what I did is I basically cut it to the, the square dimensions, which I think was nine and a half by nine and a half. And I'm gonna cut it to length on the bandsaw as well. I'll just strike a square line across the, the ends and just freehand that cut. It doesn't need to be a perfect cut because we're gonna spin this on the lathe, so I don't need a perfectly square cut, but I can get pretty darn close here on the bandsaw. I don't really have a good reason why I picked poplar. It's just an affordable wood, um, not super expensive, and it'll, it's usually pretty clean. You don't have knots and voids, so it makes a good wood to, to make a mold out of. They're gonna make a sand mold out of this to cast the cannon. Uh, so that's kind of my reasoning behind going with Poplar, mostly just because it's an affordable piece, it's affordable wood. So once we get it cut to size, what I want to do is strike my center. So I'm going to find the center of this blank from corner to corner on each end. And then I'm going to take some dividers. I'm going to oversize about half inch my radius, uh, not my radius, my diameter, just the, the, the circle for this pattern. So uh, I think it's about nine and a half inches. So I think I'm laying out about 10 inches. That gives me a little bit of wiggle room when I clean this up to make sure that I can get the actual size, which in the end turned out to be a lot more than I needed. Uh, but it's always better to play it safe and uh, get it right than not have enough material. It happens to me a lot on the lathe. So strike that on. I'll trace it on with a pencil. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to take off those corners. And this is an opportunity to uh, tilt the table on my bandsaw, which is probably the most fun thing to do in the shop. I rarely get to do it. And it's just a really cool old gear setup, and that's a very heavy table. It took three guys to get that table up there, and you can effortlessly uh, turn it to 45 with this with this system. So it's it's a lot of fun. It's pretty cool. Once I get the table to 45, we're going to just basically turn this into an octagon. I'm going to take the corners off, make it a little bit safer to turn on the lathe. Um, it's a big chunk of wood, and when you're trying to cut off those hard hard corners. It's a little bit sketchy, so the best thing to do here is just to take the corners off. I've got it on the bandsaw. Luckily, I have a bandsaw that could manage that. You could, you're cutting a small enough of a part here, you could do it on the table saw, but I just love using the bandsaw, so that's what we're gonna do. It was there was quite a bit of setup time too for this as well. Getting that fence, you can see that fence down the lower part of the of the table there, putting that fence on there was kind of a pain because I don't have a setup for my saw to have a sliding fence yet. Uh, it's a little bit beyond my engineering capabilities, so I just clamp a fence onto the table. And when you've got the table tilted like that and you're trying to clamp the fence on and you've only got two pair of hands, it's kind of challenging. And then this last cut, for some reason I thought I wasn't 
the the angle I cut wasn't clearing my fence, so I didn't think it was doable here, but I actually didn't even realize that I wasn't flat on my table. So once I kind of figured that out, it worked just fine. So let's take a quick break from the can. I want to tell you about today's sponsor, ShipStation. Please stick with me because I want to talk to you guys about the cutting boards. In the last integration with ShipStation, I pitched to you the cutting boards and you guys pulled through and ordered a lot of cutting boards. There was a lot of work to do. I had to do CNC work, carving work, sanding work. These are all things that I love to do. It's okay because I'm passionate about it. I love woodworking and I love making products for you guys. What I don't enjoy doing is shipping them. And that's where ShipStation comes in because they have an automated system that funnels all my orders into their platform and allows me to easily fulfill those orders and ship them out. Like I said, this is a family run business. My dad's in here helping me. Uh, I'm in here doing a lot. My wife's helping me in the back end and my kids even are in here. They help color on the boxes and make it kind of that family touch. So when you get your cutting board, there might be a rainbow or a butterfly on there. That's compliments of my daughter, June. Just the awesome touch that small businesses can do and provide that the big corporate companies just can't do. So with ShipStation, you can take all that logistical management stuff that takes you away from your passion and you can allow them to streamline that process. No matter how much you sell, if you sell a lot of products or a little small amount of products, kind of like me, ShipStation can help you streamline that process. You can import orders from all kinds of sales channels. You can automate just about any shipping task and ship with any carrier discounted rates. No matter where you're selling from, Amazon, Etsy, eBay, whatever your sales channel is, it all streamlines and funnels into ShipStation. It helps you manage the task of filling those orders. You can even handle it from your phone. The best part about it is you get to spend way less time on shipping and more time on doing what you love, which for me is providing a really cool product to you guys. The cutting boards are still available. They're still there, so you can still order them. They're, the pre-sale's over now, so you're not going to get a signed cutting board, but you can still order whatever you want, and I'll use ShipStation and ship it right to you. So there's a link in the description. Make ship happen. Use the promo code Andy Rawls. You get 60-day free trial. That's two months of no hassle, stress-free shipping. Just go to ShipStation.com. Find the microphone at the top of the page. Type in Andy Rawls and make ship happen. Remember, the microphone at the top of the page. Type in Andy Rawls and you get your 60-day free trial. A huge thanks to ShipStation for supporting the channel. Let's get back to this cannon build. Okay, the next step is to get this thing up on the lay, which wasn't really super easy. The first thing I did was hammer it in this drive center, uh, kind of get it locked in position. And then I tried to, well, I for totally forgot I dropped it. So that kind of shows you how difficult this was. The thing's not very light. So once I got it picked back up off the floor, we got it into the headstock and then I was able, once I got it into the headstock, I was able to hold it up and get the tailstock locked in place. Just kind of tricky here working with two hands, trying to hold it up and get it centered. That's the key is you got to get it centered because you want this thing to be balanced. And as I rotate it, even on my marks that I originally made, as I rotate it, I can tell it's a, quite a bit off balance. Watch how it falls to the same spot every time. Um, it's just, it's hard with that big of a piece to get it balanced. So the key with that is to start slow on your speed and slowly crank up the speed until basically you get vibration in your lathe, which happened pretty quick here because it's just a big heavy blink. And then that's your sweet spot. Once you catch that vibration in the lathe, you're gonna back it off and then you can start turning. Roughing this out was quite the process. It took a lot of time to get this cylinder and roughed out. Okay, so while I'm roughing out this blank, which is uh, quite the task, I must say, I want to talk a little bit about the design because this is an exact replica of an actual cannon from the Alamo. Um, we want to make sure we get it right. The crazy thing is about some of these cannons, and this one in particular, is when they get taken in battle, a lot of times um, the, the enemy will break off the trunnions or, or do something to it to make it not usable. And in this case, this cannon had missing trunnions and a missing cascabel, which is uh, off the back of the cannon. So we had to figure those out, which wasn't super difficult. Basically, they had a 3D scan of this thing done by Texas A&M. The cannon is actually at Texas A&M, and then they also had uh, dimensions made out. So they sent me that 3D scan. I was able to take that, bring it into SketchUp, scale it to the dimensions that they gave me, and then copy it out into a 2D drawing, basically, on SketchUp. 
And from that 2D drawing, I could send it to them, get them to approve it, make sure that everything was exactly how it needed to be. And then I took that to my CNC, which unfortunately I didn't have the footage of this, but I made a half inch plywood template. So a full size template of the Canon that I could then mount on my lathe. The Oliver lathe that I have has a really cool mount on the backside. So you can put that on there and mount it. And that way I could transfer over diameters and dimensions from that to my blank and make that, uh, it made it really easy to copy and get it exact how it needed to be. And so that's the process I used uh, to uh, recreate the Canon without actually having it. So we were able to take that 3D image, transfer it into a 2D drawing, CNC out a template and use that template to transfer the dimensions over to my Canon. Another challenge I was faced with is I didn't have calipers in my shop big enough. So this thing's nine, around nine inches in diameter. There's nothing in my shop that I could scale from that template over to my blank. So I, luckily I was able to draw something up in um, SketchUp and then CNC out and make some wood calipers fairly quickly. It actually worked out really well. It's like the third time I've been able to use my new CNC. That thing is really, really coming in handy. It's fun and it's useful in these areas where you're planning out, where you're designing, uh, making templates, or even having to make um, calipers. I mean, it worked out beautifully. And so I was able to use those wooden calipers to transfer dimensions from my template to my blank. Now, as we go into this turning process, it's um, it's a long process. I, I think in all, it took me a couple days to turn this. I went really slow, made sure I didn't make any mistakes. So I didn't wanna have to start over and do this again. I wanted to get it right. Uh, and so instead of showing you a long drawn out process of me turning it, I did a really cool time lapse. So I'm going to show you the time lapse and then Colby came out to the shop and we shot some cool interview footage about the Canon. I'm going to put that in with the time lapse. You're going to be able to watch me turn it and get a little bit more information on the, on the Canon project and on the history of this particular Canon. So let's just jump in to that footage now. This, this project at the Alamo has been ongoing for almost two years now. And um, a lot of people, when they visit the Alamo, they actually come and they think that the Alamo church, that iconic structure with the hump-shaped cap, is the Alamo. But in actuality, it was a much larger complex. So by taking the uh, cannons that we have in our collection, and some that have been uh, lost to time, by replicating them and putting them back on the battlefield where they would have been during the famous right. battle, it helps visitors um, kind of imagine where the old fort lines would have sat and also uh, the complexities of the battle and why the Alamo was so important. It's strategically important, but the, the artillery and cannons inside the Alamo are one of the main reasons why the battle is fought where it's fought. There are 23 um, cannons, if you include the smaller- There's 23 in there. Yeah, there, if you include the smaller swivel guns, uh, so, and of those, there are 18 that were functional. What's the smallest one? Because the four pounder's pretty small, right? Yeah, four pounder's pretty small. We had two three pounders and we had uh, two or three small swivel guns that fired a one pound ball, a little bit larger than a golf ball. Wow. So uh, this one is really neat. It was actually cast by authority of the Spanish government. It was a bronze gun and it was sent uh, to modern day Nacogdoches, Texas and to a small mission there uh, called Los Adais. And then when that mission was not so successful and it shut down, all of their stuff inside the church and the uh, Presidio, including the cannons, two three pounders and the four, were sent to the Alamo and they were put there, and then when the battle on March 6, 1836 takes place, of course, that artillery is gonna be used. So who would have been fired in the Alamo, who would have been firing this cannon? You know, that's a really good question. There's a, there's a lot of guesswork that goes into that because we'll never truly know which cannon was at which spot for the most part. Um, this four pounder, we believe, was along the Palisade wall where David Crockett and his men would have fought. And if that's the case, those men would have been in charge of firing that gun. Cool. So, um, so when this goes, this is all complete, it'll be located in that same spot current day. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So when this gun is uh, fully cast, we're going to have a carriage made for it. Yeah. And um, then it'll be put back on the battlefield in the proximal location of where we believe it would be historically. And that way, whenever people's co or people come to the Alamo, they get a sense of arrival and they understand where that wall would have been. So the next step is to put the trunnions on, which was a little bit tricky, and I wanted to make sure that I got this right. Everything was lined up on the right axis and everything. So the first thing I'm doing here is I know the point of where the trunnions need to be from the muzzle face of the cannon, so that's where I'm working at. I'm marking a center mark um, off the top of the cannon, 
And then and Texas A&M provided me with the center line to the trunnion axis um, off the top of the cannon as well, which wasn't centered on the cannon. It was actually down a little bit from the cannon center line. So now once I have those two marks yeah. laid out, I can use my laser. Try not to laser my son's face here. here. And I can Just reference it off the two end lines. So there's a center Go mark ahead. at each end of the cannon. I'll laser line that face. laser up on those center lines, and then I can rotate the cannon until the center line of that I marked on the cannon is lined up to that laser, and then I know everything is in line, the trunnions are going to be in the right spot, I can lock it down and start working from there. This is the whole jig I set up to drill these on the drill press, and um, it really worked out well. This is a, I think it's a 3 and an eighth Forstner bit, and basically I'm just going to drill down until I make a pocket, so until I completely cut into the side of the cannon then I'll stop and we'll come back and drill another hole in this it's just gonna recess those trunnions into the side of the cannon so with that done I put in I think this is a half inch bit I'm gonna run this as deep as I can I'm gonna cut all the way through the cannon. The reason I'm doing this is because I know I'm all lined up and square in my jig on the drill press, so I might as well cut all the way through and make the point for my other drill to come back. So instead of trying to flip it over and match perfectly, it would never work. This keeps it all on the same axis if I drill all the way through from this side. The challenge is this bit's not going to be long enough to do that, so I have to drill as far as I can with this bit and drop in a longer bit um, into the hole, drop my table down, rechuck it into the drill press, and then finish drilling through it. Now the problem with this is that I'm using a twist bit, and twist bits aren't good for going through your material. They don't have a point, so you can't. There's no stop. There's no way, no way you can stop and come back and drill back from the other side. So once it's done, I can loosen the cannon and, the, and it's a little jig here and rotate it around. And then um, I have to make sure I get it back on the same axis. So the way I did that is I put a hand plane underneath it and hung a drill bit out and just made sure that I was flushed up to that hand plane. I know the hand plane's flat and square. So once I was flushed up to that, I tightened it all down and um, we came back and drilled out with a Forstner bit, the big three and an eighth Forstner bit. Now I'm going to double check everything here, my measurements, make sure that I'm on the same, have the same measurements I had on the other side. I'm going to hammer this plug in. I turned it on the lathe, so you can't just come in and drill with a Forstner bit into a 3 8 hole. It would walk all over the place. So I, I need to put this plug in, and that gives a point, a tip of that bit. It gives a place for the tip of that bit to go and grab, and then it'll start its cut. So you can see it works, it works just great. Same thing as the last side. We're just going to go deep enough that we can seat that trunnion into the side of the cannon. I was super impressed, by the way, with all of the Oliver machinery, including the old one, but the Oliver lathe and this Oliver drill press all handled these, these big, heavy tasks really well. So uh, I was putting those machines to the test, and I had no issues getting everything set up with these machines. Next step is to glue in the trunnions. Like I said, these are three and an eight diameter, just round cylinders. I turned them on the lathe, nothing fancy, and they just put a little dowel into them to help kind of strengthen them, hold them in place. Maybe overkill, but I tend to operate that way. It also helps line them up, I think. If you just put them in there, that little pocket, they could move a little bit and not be straight. So I think the dowel helps keep everything in line. Get those glued in, let those set up, and then we got to do the cascabel off the back of the cannon. So the first thing we got to do for this cascabel is I need a way to attach it. I'm going to bore a hole in the back of this cannon, which 
turned out to be really difficult because it's just hard to do with one person. I got a little step drill bit here because my my uh, drive center had kind of eaten it up some. And I've screwed some holes into this, so it was hard to, to keep that center point to, to drill a hole. So I just started it with this step drill bit to try to get a hole started back in the same spot. What I'm going to end up doing is drilling a, I think we did 5 8 uh, hole into into the end of this and I'm not I'm just starting it here so I think that was a half inch there uh, and I'm just slowly kind of building up to that 5 8 so I got to get it up on I've got my drill bit drill bit chucked on the lathe a bit out of focus apologize for that got to get it all mounted up there and hold it I made a little holder here to hold it in place it, it was a really honestly I probably could have just done this by hand in retrospect and just been real diligent about keeping it straight maybe even used my bracing bit I tend <clears throat> you can usually get a pretty straight cut with that but I was determined to try this lathe I finally got it up there where I needed it and was able to to bore out this 5 8 hole and I will in all honesty will say it did did walk and get a little off center it's at some point in this process so uh, what I ended up doing to correct that was the tenon on the cascabel is going to be a little bit loose to allow me to move that and get it centered up All right, so we walk that off and get that off the lathe. Try not to mess it up. Okay, so we get that down off the lathe. Next step is I've got it, that little step there is just left over from the turning. I got to get that off. So we're just going to take a block plane and hand plane that down flat and flush. It'll provide a little shoulder for that casket bill to rest on. So I want to make sure I get it straight and, and flat and with poplar poplar cuts really easily so it's not really that difficult here i don't show the turning of the cascabel it's you know it's fairly simple little design although this cascabel which i'm going to explain here real soon uh is not the right size so we end up doing a different size too small and you can tell immediately it just looks a little bit too small okay so that closes it down for this video um i hope you guys enjoyed it a lot of information a lot of cool things happened in that video First off, that cascabel that I just installed. Now, the cascabel is a decorative piece off the end of the cannon. Um, it can be used to turn it. A lot of times they would tie a rope to it, and that would allow them to pivot and move it, move the, the, the cannon. Um, the one on this cannon was broken, as you can tell in that 3D image. So we were kind of guessing at the size. The one I put on there in the video was way too small, so uh, we put a new one on. Let me show you that. You can see it right there quite a bit bigger better proportions now you might notice this thing is half of the cannon i actually had to cut it in half for the molding process so i set this up on a jig i built and i just used the big oliver bandsaw and uh cut this thing right down the middle so now we have two pieces and i'm going to create this and ship it to the foundry i i don't know a whole lot about the foundry process but they'll make a sand mold of this and i guess they make it in these in two pieces and then put it back together and then they pour um the bronze into that mold and they cast a can in, polish it and then it'll come back to me my hope and i think i'm able to pull it off is actually fly up to the foundry it's in cincinnati it's a really cool very old company that's been making bells and all kinds of cool things for years so they know their stuff and i think it'd be really cool to film what they're doing uh part of this whole series now the downside to that is you're gonna have to wait a while it's probably gonna be more like the fall before they um, get into casting this it's going to go ahead and get shipped up there but i think on his schedule it's october before they're actually going to be able to cast it which is okay it just requires a little bit of patience i just want to thank you guys for tuning in uh leave me a comment let me know what you think a huge huge thanks to the alamo for trusting me with this project for letting me partner up with them um there is some additional interview footage that will probably drop in on my instagram and the alamo's instagram in the coming weeks so make sure to go follow both of those pages i'll link them in the description Huge thanks to ShipStation for sponsoring the video, for helping fund it all, and um, it's a lot of fun. I cannot wait to get this thing casted back in the shop and get it all finished. So until then, we'll see you next time.